Hi there. So in this video, we're going to talk about this very important signaling molecule in the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. Here I've indicated it as PIP3, although we're going to see what it looks like before it becomes PIP3. And this molecule, like I said, is very important in transmitting signals from the outside of the cell into intracellular signaling pathways. So let's see how the very important signaling molecule um, is modified, is created, and uh, helps send signals into the cell. So we're going to start in the cytosol or the cytoplasm. I've drawn a plasma membrane here, and I have drawn a sugar. So what is this sugar? It is the sugar inositol. So it is a six carbon sugar. I've drawn uh, the ring. I've drawn hydroxyls on it. So we're going to modify this sugar inositol to create something else that um, lives uh, in the plasma membrane. Uh, it's embedded in the plasma membrane and it's pointing toward the uh, cytoplasmic side of the plasma membrane. So I'm going to draw inositol modified by enzymes and we're not going to get into detail into what these enzymes are. But now when I draw inositol, you're going to see it's, it's modified a little bit. And we're going to give it a new name, phosphotidyl inositol. So what is phosphotidyl inositol? So we've taken um, inositol and added a phosphate group to the um, one prime hydroxyl. So remember the carbons are numbered one to six. And so carbon number one, the hydroxyl that's coming off car of carbon number one now has a phosphate group attached to it. Attached to the phosphate group is um, uh, a lipid molecule. So you remember lipids, right? Fatty acid tails, glycerol heads. So there is a uh, fatty acid chain with a glycerol uh, covalently attached to that phosphate group. So this molecule, phosphatidyl inositol, can be inserted into the plasma membrane via this lipid tail, via this fatty acid tail. And now that it's embedded into the plasma membrane, it sort of hangs off, um, and again, pointing toward the cyto cytosol part of the plasma membrane. Um, so this is phosphatidyl inositol commonly referred to as PI. You can't write out that big name all the time, phosphatidyl inositol. And again, all it is, it's a sugar with a phosphate group and then a lipid attached to it. So that way, that's the simple version of it. If you want to see the real version, you can Google the actual structure of it. But for now, we're just going to do that. This can be further modified by enzymes, and I'm not going to go into what enzymes modify this phosphatidyl inositol. But suffice it to say, if we add phosphate groups to a molecule, we must be using a kinase. So kinases are involved here. And now you'll see that I've drawn phosphatidyl inositol, or PI, a little bit differently. I've added two phosphate groups to it, to the um, four prime and five prime hydroxyls. So this molecule here, um, we could write its name a number of different ways. We could call it phosphatidyl inositol, with uh, phosphates on the four and five prime hydroxyls. So sometimes you see this molecule referred to as PI, parentheses, four and five, um, P2, because that's where the phosphates are added to those four and five prime hydroxyls. That name's a little long and cumbersome. So uh, a more common name for this molecule is called PIP2. This is a very important molecule, signaling molecule, PIP2. And instead of drawing out all these carbons and, you know, having flashbacks of organic chemistry, um, we're just going to typically draw this molecule, and most people typically just draw this molecule as PIP2. And I've, again, I've seen, I've drawn that little uh, lipid tail that embeds this um, sugar into the plasma membrane. And that's where PIP2 should be. It's in the plasma membrane. So, PIP2. All it is? Is the sugar inositol modified with phosphates and a lipid tail. That's all PIP2 is. Very simple. So now um, let's modify PIP2. So in the cell, in a resting cell that's in G1, um, <clears throat> you find high levels of PIP2. And again, I can draw PIP2 two different ways. I can draw it just with the, the word PIP2, or if you want, I could add the phosphate, um, that one prime at the one prime and then phosphates at the four and five prime position. But again, I typically don't. I typically just write PIP2. 
this uh, molecule can get further modified by a very important enzyme called PI3K or PI3 kinase. And this kinase is mutated often in human cancers or dysregulated in human cancers. And we're going to have at least one, if not two, videos on PI3 kinase and how signals reach PI3 kinase out from the outside of the cell. But for now, we're just going to talk about PI3 kinase's function. So PI3 kinase, it's a kinase. Its substrate is PIP2. So when PI3 kinase is present and active, it will take PIP2 and it will, or if it's a kinase, it'll phosphorylate PIP2. It grabs ATP, takes the terminal phosphate off ATP, puts it onto PIP2. So what's that going to generate? So what's the product of the reaction? So I'll just draw again. That is what PIP2 is. So a, a PI3 kinase will grab a phosphate off of ATP and put it there on the 3' prime hydroxyl. So now what did PI3 kinase generate? What is the product? Well, you could write it out this way, uh, phosphatidyl inositol, parentheses, 3, 4, 5 phosphates, right? Because that's where the, the location of the phosphates are on those hydroxyls. But again, that you see that name sometimes, um, but the more common name for this molecule is PIP3. So PIP2 um, had two phosphates on the inositol sugar. Um, actually, it had three phosphates, right? There was a phosphate at the... Uh, um, one prime hydroxyl, but uh, PIP2 had sort of two hydroxyl at the sort of bottom there, and now it has three, I mean phosphates. So uh, PIP2 is converted into PIP3 by PI3 kinase. And PI3, uh, PIP3 is a very important signaling molecule. Many proteins can bind PIP3 uh, using a protein domain called a pH domain. Um, it's not important what pH stands for, um, but it's not it has nothing to do with acidity. Um, so a pH domain binds very tightly and strongly to this P PIP3 um, molecule. And we're going to learn about proteins that contain pH domains. There are more than 50 in human cells. And this binding will trigger a signaling cascade into the um, cytoplasm. So PIP3 is a very important signaling molecule when it is present in the cell. So uh, when cells are in G1, you typically have G PIP2, high levels of PIP2. When cells get a signal to go through the cell cycle, when cells get signals from outside the cell and they activate, end up activating PIP3 kinase, PIP3 is generated. So that's great. Um, let's talk about one more way to regulate levels of PIP3 because it's going to be very important to regulate the levels of PIP3 if you want to regulate the cell cycle, cell proliferation, cell viability, uh, metabolism. So you can't leave PIP3 in the cell all the time. Um, that would be bad. That's what happens in cancer cells. So there's got to be a way to um, somehow deactivate this PIP3 signal. One way to do it would be to reverse this uh, reaction. So how can a uh, this molecule PIP3 be converted back into PIP2? So you know, hopefully, of an enzyme that can remove phosphates, and those enzymes are called phosphatases. So there is a phosphatase in this reaction uh, that regulates levels of PIP2 and PIP3, and that phosphatase is called P10. Again, we're not going to get into what it stands for, but I can tell you P10 is also mutated often in human cancers. So it's very important to understand what P10 is. It is a phosphatase, and it will remove that phosphate from PIP3 and convert it back into PIP2. So PI3 kinase and P10 have these um, uh, roles that are opposite, um, the words are antagonistic roles, um, where PI3 kinase will help create more PIP3, and P10 will help lower levels of PIP3. Okay, and we're gonna learn, again, what, how important PIP3 is in a later video when we talk about AKT, the AKT kinase. So, um, again, just to summarize what I've talked about, and again, nobody's gonna be drawing out all those molecules with all those carbons and hydroxyls. Typically, this is how we just draw it, PIP2 and PIP3, and arrows that go between PIP2 and PIP3. And what do those arrows represent? They represent PI3 kinase 
phosphorylating PIP2 and creating PIP3, which will send signals into the cell. And also we can have an arrow going from PIP3, converting it back into PIP2 um, by action of the enzyme P10, which is a phosphatase. So this is how you typically see it drawn in many research articles. So PIP, and we'll learn, like I said, PIP3 is a very important signaling molecule. PIP2 can also be modified by other enzymes, which I want to talk about, because again, this is a very important signaling molecule in the cell. So PIP2 can be modified by another enzyme other than PI3 kinase. It can be modified by an enzyme called PLIC, or PLC, or phospholipase C. So now, instead of having a kinase act on PIP2, we have a lipase acting on PIP2. What's a lipase do? Well, hopefully, you remember what lipases do, maybe from the digestive system, um, the part of freshman biology, lipases break down lipids, right? And a phospholipase is gonna break down a phospholipid. And actually, if you recall, right, this uh, PIP2 molecule is tethered to the plasma membrane via a lipid. So what phospholipase does, and again, we're not getting into uh, how it's regulated, but PLIC or phospholipase C is regulated from extracellular signals. So there are proteins in the plasma membrane like G protein coupled receptors that can activate PLIC. And when it does, PLIC is activated, it will cleave PIP2. So it'll actually cleave um, near the uh, lipid. Right? And again, you know, it's made of fatty acid tails and glycerol. We're not going to get into the structure. But when uh, phospholipase C cleaves PIP2, it will generate two molecules, one that's still embedded in the plasma membrane called DAG or diacetylglycerol, and another molecule that now is untethered from the plasma membrane. So what do you think this molecule is called? So I see the inositol sugar, and I see three phosphates attached to it. So inositol with three phosphates, a so position uh, hydroxyl one, four, and five prime. So this molecule is often referred to as IP3. So this is different than PI3 or PIP3, it's IP3. IP3 is actually not tethered to the plasma membrane because the lipid has been cleaved off. And IP3 can go into the uh, cytosol and send signals into, uh, into the cytosol. And one of the more um, well-known signals is it triggers calcium released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a type of endoplasmic reticulum, in muscle cells. So when uh, muscle cells get a signal to contract, that signal is sent through IP3, right? And again, where did IP3 come from? Came from PIP2. So again, PIP2, very important central signaling molecule. And here you have learned two ways uh, PIP2 can be modified by enzymes. So again, you don't have to worry about the structure of inositol or how did we make PI or how do we make PIP2? Um, because I think PIP2 is probably the more important uh, you know, point to understand here. So when cells have PIP2, they can cells can receive signals to convert PIP2 into either PIP3 or uh, IP3 and DAG. And those signals, those allow the cells to set, transmit signals into the cytoplasm. And again, from, for the, uh, from the point of view of human cancer cells, um, we'll be talking in more detail in later videos about PI3K and its function and its makeup and mutations in, uh, as well as P10 because those proteins um, are often mutated in human cancers. So hopefully from this video, you have now have a good appreciation of what PIP2 is and how PIP2 can be modified by enzymes.